kind and loving Father, Lord, we continue, Lord, to ask that you may be with us now as we continue this study. Please, Lord, uh, bless us and this meeting. We pray for your mercies and for your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, saints. Uh, so we are continuing, like I said, from um, our study uh, in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, Brother Sipe touched um, last week um, Daniel 1 and introducing us to the book of Daniel. Very important lessons that we learned in, in, uh, last week. But what I want us to do um, at this time is to go to Daniel chapter 2. Now you would remember that Daniel is divided in fact into two, 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 uh, two parts. So you have the first part that is from chapter 1 to chapter 6 and that is more of stories and narratives. These are you know, recorded experiences and encounters and circumstances that Daniel had to encounter in the kingdom of Babylon which are very, very important because we, we, we want to understand that the lessons from the life of Daniel and how Daniel responded to some of the crises and the challenges that he faced in Babylon, those are the challenges that we are going to face. So it's very important for us to understand that these are just not stories, uh, but these are life lessons. This, this, this is a model for God's people and how we are going to meet the life crisis. So it's sort of like uh, God is opening the curtain and is giving us details on how the things are going to play out in the end of time. The book of Daniel is unique in that sense. Then from chapter seven, uh, you know, up to the rest of chapter 12, we have prophetic um, and apocalyptic ap visions. Um, yeah, so... But with chapter one, the first part, with chapter one to chapter six, it's only one chapter that is sort of prophetic and apocalyptic in nature. Um, yeah, so, it, it, and it's very important for us to understand that chapter two is sort of forms the basis for all the prophetic, you know, chapters that we are going to read from chapter seven to chapter eight um, and the other chapters like chapter 11 as well. To chapter 12. So they are sort of the, the foundational basis of how we can understand those chapters because those chapters from chapter 7, they are going to be building up from the prophecy of Daniel chapter, chapter 2. So it's very important that we understand Daniel chapter 2 from that perspective because you would find that there are challenges that people would have like interpretation, challenges um, and conflicts that people would have when you reach chapter 11, where there would be different kinds of interpretation of the chapter, but it needs not to be so because we have a basis of how we can actually understand the rest of the chapters because that lays the foundation on how to understand the rest of the chapters of the prophetic chapters of Daniel. So that chapter is very important in that sense. I hope that that point is emphasized like that in our mind. So it's very important for us to understand like that. But what we are going to do in this study, we are going to look at just the first chapter, the first aspect of Daniel chapter two. We are going to do two studies on this chapter. We are looking at the first aspect and the second aspect of Daniel chapter two. The first aspect is really just the lessons that we can glean, not only from Daniel, but some aspects of, uh, you know, what God actually, the methods of how God reveals truth and some of the lessons we can learn from how Daniel deals with this crisis that comes upon them. Um, that is very important. Then on our next study, uh, next, uh, next Wednesday, We'll, we'll look at the prophetic aspect, that is the dream and the interpretation, but more focus, we are going to be focusing more in the last aspect of the, you know, the, the last aspect of the dream, that is the last events of, of, of that prophetic dream that was revealed to King Nebuchadnezzar. 
and and put more emphasis there and and see what what we can learn from there. So that is that is how we are going to do it. I think these lessons we are going to learn are very important. They're important in that sense. Now I'm going to break down Daniel uh, from chapter one, the verses therefore. And I, and, I, and I really just want us to get the anatomy of chapter two from the verses. So from the verse one to verse 13, we have the king and his dream and his interactions with the wise men of Babylon. And um, then from chapter 14 to chapter 30, we have Daniel now coming into the picture. And Daniel now comes into the picture because there's a decree that has been issued that all the wise men of Babylon should be killed. And Daniel, they go seeking him and his friends to go and kill him. And he comes into the picture like that. And he goes, he asks time, they give him time, he goes with his friends, he goes and prays. God reveals the dream to him. He stands before the king and he tells him that that which the wise men and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans have failed to do, the God of heaven has actually revealed it. And God is exalted because he reveals uh, the dream from verse 31 to verse 49. He reveals the dream. That is the aspect of what composes the dream and the interpretation of the dream, which is what we are going to look at in our next study next week. Yeah, so that's how the, the chapter is divided, the division of the chapter. Now, let's go and study. We are just going to begin in Daniel chapter 2. Now, the first thing that I want us to notice or to, to note with Daniel chapter 2, the first lesson there is that God is the one who's able to read the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. So God is not just uh, the one who sees just from the outside, but God is able to penetrate even to our hearts, see exactly what we are thinking, the very intentions of our hearts and the motives and see what, what actually plays. We are going to see this very clear from the book of Daniel chapter two. Let's just go there from verse 29. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy birth. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets, I want you to note that, he that revealeth secrets, Make known to thee what shall come to pass. So what was happening here is that Nebuchadnezzar was sitting in his bed. He was just sitting. He was not speaking with anyone. He was just alone. He was contemplating in deep thought, trying to think of what is going to happen to his kingdom and to him in the future. So he was sort of like anxious of what is going to happen. And there were thoughts that were flooding his mind. And he's, he was really trying to understand this. And we see that what really he what what he wanted to understand what uh, was the future of his kingdom. That is what he was anxious about. And the interesting thing in verse one of chapter two, the Bible tells us that God gives him the answer to the very the questions that troubled his heart. And the Bible reveals this very clear from verse one to verse two. Uh, the Bible says, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams. Uh, wherefore, his spirit was troubled and his sleep broke from him. Verse 2. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. So this is exactly what God is doing. God is revealing to Nebuchadnezzar exactly what was troubling him. But what is interesting is that when he wakes up from the dream, God takes away the dream from him. He does not remember any detail of that dream. But something that has left in his mind is an impression and how impressive this is, this was, and how important he felt that he needed to know and understand what he had just dreamed about. And so this thought has been, this imprint, the impress is just left in his mind, and he feels that it's very important for him to know what he had just dreamed. And he goes to call. The first thing that he does, he calls 
the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers. And the Bible says he calls the magicians and he assembles them to his palace. And he asks them, he says, tell me what I have dreamt. Tell me the interpretation of what I've dreamt. And the Bible in verse three tells us their response. And the king said to them, I have dreamed a dream and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. So this was something that was really important for him to understand. He was troubled by this. He needed to understand what exactly he had dreamt. Now look at their response. The response of the wise man. Let's look at what their answer is. Look at verse. We are not going to read all the verses, but we are going to be jumping and just picking up those ones that are of interest uh, that we want to bring forth. From verse 10. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, there is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, Lord, no ruler that asketh such things at any magicians or astrologers or Chaldeans. So they are saying that what you are asking is unreasonable. There is no one who can ask such things. We don't have answers to the questions that you are asking. Look at verse 11. It says, it is a rare thing that the king required, and there is none other that can show it before the king, except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Whose dwelling is not with flesh. So what the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans, what they are doing is that they are acknowledging the fact that they they, they cannot tell, they cannot solve his problem. They cannot tell him his dreams. They cannot tell him the interpretation and they are constantly asking him, tell us the dream. We will tell you the interpretation of it. Tell us the dream. We will tell you the interpretation of it. Now, saints, we need to understand what God really here was doing. God is exposing the religion of Babylon. He is exposing the wise men of Babylon. Now, the magicians, how they would do is that they would use their superstitions, you know, and, you know, their schemes to try to tell the future. And they had a way of, you know, to say, you know, of revealing or, you know, secrets to their kings. The, the astrologers, they use the stars, the constellations to try to foretell of what is going to come in the future and what is going to happen. So they used all of that astrology to try to tell of the future and what is going to happen. Then you have the sorcerers who would communicate with the dead, who would communicate with that spirit, and they would seem to come with sort of like secrets and, and communicate with the living to say, this is exactly what the dead says. You know, and the Chaldeans are more of like your philosophers. They use the same method, similar to the, you know, the, the not the, the astrologers, but the, the magicians. Similar to the, the, the magicians, they use the same method. And what God is really doing here, God is exposing them. He is exposing them. God is trying to tell the king that the religion of Babylon is actually not a religion. It does not stand the test of time because they have been standing in the palace and they have been coming with scheme after scheme. They've been coming with, you know, lots of false predictions and prophecies trying to say to the king, this is exactly what is going to happen. This is exactly what is going to happen. And the king, you know, has been seeing these things because you can see in the chapter itself, I want us to look at this from verse, um, look at from verse nine. Uh, from starting from verse eight, it says, the king answered and said, I know of certainty that you would gain the time because you see the thing is gone from me. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For you have prepared lines and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. So the king knew clearly that what they have been doing, 
they have been lying, they have been composing lies and schemes to try to, you know, to deceive in some way. But this was a test for them. This was a test for them. If they cannot tell the dream, if they cannot tell the interpretation thereof, and they, that means they cannot stand the test. That means all that they have been claiming to be is actually false. They are false magicians. They are false prophets in some way. So what they have been claiming to be has been put to the test. And God did this deliberately to take away the dream from the king because God wanted to expose them. God wanted to expose them. This is very interesting because God does not want us to trust in the wise man of the world because the wise man of that world of Babylon you, you would remember that Babylon was the greatest empire of the time. So the wise men and the sophistication and the science and the knowledge, you just have to read the history to understand, you know, the inventions and the, uh, and the kind of uh, the science and all of the things that were coming from. Great things came from Babylon. You know, when you're speaking of science and inventions and all of those things, you really, when you read the history, you see that this was a sophisticated civilization that has ever been from that time before the other empires had come. This was a serious um, civilization at the time. So, so God was really with the wise men of that world. God with the wise men of that world is depicted here, the wise men of the world today. Are we together, saints? God is trying to tell us that we cannot trust them. We cannot trust the wise men. We cannot trust those who are learned. God does not reveal the truth through them. Even though God is going to bring the truth to them, but God does not use them as agents to bring the truth to the king and to the rest of the world. We have to understand that. In fact, I want us to see this from the book of Corinthians. Let's go to the book of Corinthians. This, this, this lessons are very important. First Corinthians, we are going to read uh, from chapter one to verse 27 to 29. Look at, look at what the Bible has to say. But, but God have chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and God have chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised have God chosen. Yea, the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Look at the reason in verse 29. That no flesh should glory in his presence. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Now, I want you to look at the, 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 what God chooses. The Bible says the foolish things of the world, the weak things of the world, things that are based, things that are not to bring to naught, things that are. And he gives us the reason why God chooses to work in that way. It is because so that man may not glory in his presence. Saints, you see, the wise men of Babylon, the wise of men, men, men of Babylon, if, 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 if the dream had been told to them, you know, they were going to try to arrange their interpretation that suits their own, you know, um, that suits them to try to appease the king. And they were going to take all the glory to themselves. They were going to say, it is because of this wisdom. It is because of this mind. It is because of this that we were able to do this. So the glory was going to be focused to them rather than to God. But God does not work with people like that. God says, I am going to expose them because I really want to work with people who are humble, people who are converted, and people when God has actually done the work, they will be able to point at the work and point at God, that God has been the one who has been able to do this. They are not going to take the glory. They are going to deflect the glory to God. 
they are going to reflect the glory to God. That's very important, saints, because we are living in a time where there is so much attention to self. There is so much attention to, you know, to ourself. And man has deflected, has taken all the glory, you know, of the knowledge that is there, of the wisdom that is there, of the inventions and the things that are coming. Man is taking all the glory to himself. God is no longer in the picture. God is no longer in the picture. And what God is trying to tell us here is that God is not going to work that way. He did not work in that way in the time, you know, in the time in Babylon. He didn't work through the, 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 the wise men of Babylon of the time. And he is not going to work through the wise men even today. There are people now who are rising in our ranks who have PhDs and masters in theology, they are beginning to take the scriptures and, you know, and twist them. And they are beginning to doubt the very scriptures. And they are saying, no, because I have a PhD, I have an understanding in the Greek, you know, and, and Hebrew. Therefore, this is not what was meant to be. In fact, there are portions of the Bible, as we, as, as we, as we hear now, there are portions of the Bible that are declared not to be true and they are not supposed to be there. Now, who, who saints sits in that seat and who decides what is inspired and what is not inspired? That man thinks that he is so wise, he is so elevated that he can stand in the very place where he can decide that this is divine and this is not divine. This is exactly one of the reasons why God is not choosing to work through this way. We cannot trust the wise men. We cannot trust those who have exalted themselves, who take the scriptures and who twist them for their own destruction. That's what the Bible says. And God was exposing them. God was exposing them. And we are going to see how God is, how God works. How God works. In fact, it's very interesting that the wise man in verse 11, I want you to see what they say in verse 11. And it is a rare thing that the king requires, and there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with man or with flesh. Now consider what they are saying. They are saying, we are not able to tell you the dream. In fact, our gods, or even the gods that we inquire from, they are not able to reveal the secrets. And he says something interesting, the last part, which I'm very interested in, he says the gods, their dwelling is not with flesh. So they are making a distinction, and we are going to see a distinction here between the God of the Bible and the pagan gods, the gods here that they are speaking about. But here what they are revealing is that their God dwells in secret. It does not dwell with man. And they are, um, they cannot be able to communicate with them and see and hear what these secrets are. Hear what the secrets are. Definitely this is a different, this, are, this is different from the God of the Bible. We are going to see that um, just now. Go to Amos chapter 3. Amos, we are reading in chapter 3, verse 7. The Bible says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets. He revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophet. So do you see that God is not the one who keeps secrets? But God wants to reveal his secrets. But who does he reveal his secrets to? The Bible tells us to his servants, the prophets. So God inspires or he gives dreams and visions to a prophet of what is going to come, you know, of the future and of the secrets that he unfolds to his people. And God reveals his truth like that. But we, we see something, a distinction here between the gods 
that the, the you know the astrologers, the magicians, and the the Chaldeans, the, the sorcerers, you know, speak of that this is a different God altogether. This is not the God of the Bible. In fact, when you read in Revelation, uh, the first verse, the first verse, Revelation chapter one, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is not hidden. It says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. It's a revelation. It is revealed. It is opened up. It has been unfolded. It's not secret. It's not hidden. That is a different God that we see. God is always seeking to reveal, you know, to, to open the understanding for his people to understand the light thereof. But we see that the gods, the pagan gods, are different in that they are always hiding information. They are always hiding, you know, the secret things. And uh, But God is always willing to reveal the truth to his people. If we seek the truth, you know, with good intentions and we really want to understand with humility of spirit, God is going to reveal it to us. God is going to reveal it to us. So that's the distinction that we see with the God of the Bible and the pagan gods. But but they, they say something, you know, that is so interesting with regards to the theology now that has formed up and is, is you know, this theology has been, has corrupted uh, the church. And it is that, God is so far off, he does not dwell with flesh. So in other words, they have the picture of this God who is so not in touch with his creation. He's so far removed. In other words, he's so far removed from his people. He dwells there and they dwell here and he does not have that interaction with his people, with his creation. He is not, he is not, you know, on a continual basis interested in their affairs to interfere, you know, in, in the affairs of man and the circumstances of their lives. That is the kind of God that they are presenting. That is the pagan God. And I want us to just talk about that for a moment because it's very interesting that we understand. In fact, there is this understanding with... Um, you know, what is this understanding of, of God, that God created the world. And after he created the world, he, you know, he left creation and creation is just on itself. You know, and it's just moving. Everything is just moving by its own. But God is not involved. God is not interested in the affairs of man. He is not involved in any way. But that is that is the kind of God that they are presenting. He is not the one who dwells with flesh. His dwelling is not with flesh. Now, when you read in John chapter one, a very powerful book that proves the divinity of Jesus Christ. When you read in John chapter one, we read that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Are we together? So he was in the beginning with God. So as far as you can go from the beginning, you are going to find Jesus. You are going to find God there. He was not only with God, but the Bible says that he is himself God. In verse 14, the Bible says the word was what? Was made flesh and dwelled with us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of truth, full of truth. Um, yeah, so we see that God in the book of John, he's the one who came and established his tabernacle with man. He came, he's interested to the point that the Bible takes, he took the flesh and he became just not the God who's just removed 
far from his creation, far from his people, but he became even one of us, like us. Blood among F. For a number of years, you know, interacted with man. He got hungry as well. You know, he walked distances. You know, he would get tired as we are. You know, equally God and also equally human. It's a mystery, saints. It is a mystery. And this is the kind of God that is presented in the Bible. When you read in Genesis, just after the fall of man, in Genesis chapter 3, we see a God who is coming into the garden. In fact, even before they fell, inspiration speaks of the fact that God would come and commune with them and reveal to them and unfold to them, you know, the mysteries of the divine things, the deep things of God. Adam would commune face to face with God. And so we see a different God here, a God who, who is so in touch, who is so interested in the affairs of man, who comes and communes with man, you know, and God comes even after the fall. He asks man, Adam, what have you done? Where are you? And he starts asking them questions and interrogating them and trying to understand. So we see that God is not removed, saints. In, in Exodus, we read in chapter 25, verse 8, when the instruction is given to Moses, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Saint, do you know that the Bible even tells us that the same body that Jesus took, the flesh, when he left and ascended to heaven, it is the same body that he is going to have when we meet him, when we are translated and our bodies are changed and we are transformed. We are going to have new bodies, but Jesus is going to remain with the same body to show that he is so in touch with his creation that he was willing to go as far as becoming a human to save those that are lost. So it's very important, saints, for us to understand that God is so close to us. He is so close to us that we can call for him. He is so near to us that like, he is so near to us, saints, we don't understand that when we can call upon him, he is here. He is so close. He is so intimate. He is, and he seeks that, you know, relationship, that communion with us, that we can be as close to him. We can be so intimate with him that we will become like him in character. We'll be merciful, we'll be kind, we'll be gracious, we'll be long-suffering. You know, all the character of God as is revealed in his word. So that's what we find in, in the book of Daniel. And I, and I want us to just continue and see the other lessons. Um, Daniel chapter two. Let's go back to Daniel. Daniel chapter two. Now, I want us to see something very interesting here. Um, when the wise men fail to interpret the dream, there is a decree that comes. And I want us to see that this is the intention of Satan. That's the second point. The intention of Satan was not really targeted at the wise men. When the death decree came for them to be killed and to be cut in pieces, that was not targeted at the wise men of Babylon. The target was God's people. Because Satan understood something. He understood something. In fact, let's just read that from verse 12. For this cause, the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they saw Daniel and his fellows to be slain. They thought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Do you see that they are coming after Daniel? They are coming after Abednego and Shadrach and Meshach. They are coming after them. The target really here 
is not the wise men of Babylon. It's not the astrologers. It's not the, you know, the magicians and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans. That's not the target for Satan. They are already in error. They are already in darkness. The target of Satan is God's people. It is Daniel and his three friends. Because Satan knew that from chapter one, he saw them standing the test of diet. He saw, he saw their faithfulness, that they were not going to defile themselves with the king's meat, with his wine and everything that was offered in the palace. They were not going to do it. They were going to stand. Their integrity was going to be intact. Satan saw it. And Satan saw that even when the king assembled them after three years, he saw that they were 10 times better and why than all the, the, the wise men of Babylon. They were exalted. So, so Satan could see that God was working through these young people. God was bringing the light to the hidden nation through Daniel and his fellow friends. Because, you know, if you really read the, the book of Daniel, especially from the very six chapters, the first six chapters, you see that this is God's attempt to reach the hidden king. God's love and his attempt and everything that God was going to do to reach him, to know so that the king may know him and accept him as we see that the king later on is, is converted. This is God's attempts to actually reach at him. And Daniel and, and, and Satan could see, you know, in glimpses that God here was trying to do something. And what was his plan? It's like, let me take them off of the picture, off the scene. Let me kill them with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Well, his plan did not work because when we read in verse 14, the Bible tells us that then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Ariel, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise man of Babylon. He answered with wisdom, with counsel and wisdom. Now in chapter one, verse 17, I want us to just read that. It says, for these four children, that is Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the names that they are given. Um, it says, as for these four children, God gave them knowledge, first, skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So they were given knowledge. They were given wisdom. They were given skill in all the learnings of uh, the Babylonians, whether the sciences and all of those things that they studied there. But the Bible also mentions that God gave them wisdom. And to Daniel, God gave him the, the, the gift of prophecy, you know, to interpret visions and dreams. Interesting in verse chapter two, verse 14, when Daniel answers, he answers with counsel and wisdom. So that which God gave him, what, because of their faithfulness, what, that which God had given them, Daniel did not just sit and say, I'm not going to use this talent. Because we have seen that Daniel is someone who was very wise. He was very diplomatic in how he interacted with one who was in charge of them. And the, and the way he answers here, he answers with counsel and wisdom. So he didn't just answer, but he was answering in a manner that you know was was sort of appealing and winning the favor of the one who was in charge who the, the decree was given for them to be killed and so you see that god really here was at work god was working through daniel and his friends and he asked for a meeting with the king a short meeting and he's given that opportunity and he asked for a time and this, the, the, another point, uh, the third point I really want us to consider here is God's method of revealing the truth. 
You know, how does God reveal the truth? When, uh, we, when we are in a crisis, like Daniel and his friends were in a crisis, they were threatened with death. You know, their life here was in danger. Satan wanted to kill them and take their lives. But God, God didn't allow it to happen. God didn't allow it to happen because there was still a work to be done. There was still a work to be done. Look at verse chapter two. We are going to look at verse. Um, yeah, let's look at verse. Yeah, let's look at verse fifteen and verse sixteen. He answered and said unto Ariel, the king, the kept the keep the king's captain. Why is the decree so haste from the king? Then Ariok made the thing known to Daniel. Verse 16. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give them time and that he would show the interpretation. Verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Meshael, and Azariah, and his companion. What did Daniel, Daniel do? He didn't go to consult a magician. He didn't go to consult a sorcerer. He didn't use all the methods that the Babylonians would use when they are in a crisis, when they are faced with a the situation. They did, he didn't use all of those methods. What did he do? He used the method that we should use when we are in crisis, when we are looking for answers, when our lives are threatened, this is how God would want us to respond. In how? God says here, they went to the house. That's what the Bible says. He went to the house. He told his friends. And they sought to seek the mercies of God. Through prayer and supplication. That night, they didn't sleep. They prayed. They prayed to God. And when they were praying, they believed that God had their prayers. And indeed, he had their prayers. Because God revealed to Daniel the dream and the interpretation of it. So that's a lesson, saints, that we have to learn. You see, we are going to see, even in verse chapter 9, chapter 9, chapter 10, something that comes up about the life of Daniel is that he was someone who was, he had a life of prayer. He was a prayerful man. In chapter 11, we see that. Prayer was a part of his life. You know, he prayed so much. And, and this is important for those who are, you know, for us who are, who are living in the end of time, just the events before Jesus is going to come, the closing events of this earth history. The life of prayer, we are going to speak about it, I think, in the in, in, in our studies, in the second, in the in the chapters that we are going to study. We are going to talk about the life of prayer, the life, the Daniel's life of prayer. And this is what we see here. Daniel does not trust in himself. Daniel does not have any confidence in himself or any you know confidence in his strength and his wisdom. Daniel is so humble that he goes, the first thing that he does, he says, let us pray. Let us ask God in his mercies. What is it that we should do? Let us ask him and consult him. Because Daniel knew that God hears prayers. When he prays to God, God listens to the prayers and God answers the prayers. He does not only hear the prayer, but he answers our prayer. So prayer is a very critical part for those who are going to be living in the end of time. Prayer is very important in the life of a Christian, especially in the times that we are living in saints. But we need to pray. We need to have people that we can pray with. People, like-minded people, people who fear God, who we can assemble together, Spend all the night in prayer. You know, when, when, you, when you want, you know, something and you want to understand something, whether you want to understand the prophecies of the Bible or you want to understand something critical of your life, you know, you want to make a certain decision in your life, whether you're seeking a life partner, you know, or whether you, you know, you're trying to, you know, you're trying to understand or choose a career for yourself. 
and you are trying to make major decisions in your life, the Bible tells us that we should be people who pray, who consult God. We ask his wisdom, his mercies, and we come together with close, like-minded people who fear God. We counsel together with them and we pray together with them. In the book of Proverbs, Solomon says, in the multitudes of counselors, there is safety. In the multitudes of counselors, there is safety. So that's, that's the approach. That's the kind of life that God would want us to live. I really think that is very important. Now, I want us to see something here, uh, just after their prayer, that they would, you know, desire the message of God, verse 18, of God of heaven, concerning the secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel, verse 19, in a night vision, then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the light dwelleth with him. Powerful. So not only does God reveal this dream, but I want you to see the attitude in this verse. The attitude of, the, of Daniel, the attitude that Daniel has, even when the dream is revealed to him, what does he do? The Bible says he praises God. He blesses him. He praises him. He praises his name. Blessed be the God of heaven. Blessed the name of God forever and ever. For wisdom and might are his. He praises God. Saints, when you have been praying for something, whatever, whether you've been praying for a job, whether you've been praying for a life partner, whether you've been praying to understand what, you know, what, what a decision for a decision you're about to take, whatever you've been praying for, for a child who is, you know, just left and, you know, he, he's probably maybe just left his relationship with God. Whatever that you've been praying for, when God answers a prayer, you don't go to the tavern. You don't throw a party and start dancing and drinking alcohol and trying to rejoice and do all. That's not what we do, saints. The Bible says that you have to thank and give blessings to God. In fact, there are quite verses. There are a number of verses that I want us to read with respect to this. Let us check this from the book of Thessalonians. Um, first Thessalonians, first Thessalonians, first Thessalonians chapter five. I want us to read from verse 18. Chapter five, verse 18. It says, in everything, do what? Give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning. So what is the will of God concerning us? Is that we must give thanks. We must be people who cultivate that spirit of thanksgiving, of thankfulness, of gratitude towards God. And, and look at what it says here. Not in some of the things, but it says in everything. In everything we should give thanks. And this is not only in the good things that God does for us. In all things, whether bad or evil, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. So whatever things that befall us as God's people, whether good, you know, whether bad, in God's eyes, if God is working out, you know, things. And it, it is providence. It is providence that we are sometimes going through these things. And God would want us not to have gloomy faces and not to be sad about what happens to our life. He wants us to cultivate a spirit of gratitude, to give thanks to God in everything, 
that God does for us. And this is the attitude that we see in Daniel. Daniel, when God has answered his prayer, he goes to God and he gives him thanks. He expresses his gratitude. He gives praises to God. That's exactly what we should do. When you have gotten a job, a new job, when you have, you have been accepted into university, when this that you have been praying about, God has answered that prayer, we should give thanks and glory to God. You know, sometimes even the heathens, you know, they do this better than us. To their gods, of course, you know, they slaughter the cows and, you know, they do this and they, they, they throw a, a big ceremony and they thank their gods. They, they, they thank their gods, but God's people, you know, with a God, a true God who created the heavens and the earth. And there is no one like him. When God has blessed them, when God has answered our prayers, we do not thank him. We forget him immediately when we receive the blessings. We forget God. And we are going to remember him when we are in trouble again. That is not the attitude that God wants us to have. God wants us to have an attitude, an attitude of thanksgiving, an attitude of, of giving thanks to him. In fact, <clears throat> Um, let's go to the book of Psalms. Then we'll read maybe on this point the last, uh, the last verse, Psalms 35. And us to see in Psalms 35, we are going to read in verse 18, Psalms 35, verse 16. It says, I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee amongst much people. Not only in secret, but we should be able to give thanks, to go to church, you know, with um, with 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 um, with our offerings of thanksgiving to God in the church, and we stand there and we give a testimony for what God has done. It appeals those others to see that God answers prayer, to see that when God has worked in our lives, that we give thanks to Him, not only in secret but also in the church. When God has done something, we give thanks to Him. That's a very important lesson for us to learn since. Because, you know, interesting enough, you see here a contrast of the pagans through what uh, Nebuchadnezzar does and what, what Daniel does when he responds to a challenge that is given to him. So Nebuchadnezzar, when he is faced with the challenge, the first thing he does, as we saw from Daniel chapter 2, verse 2, is that he calls the wise men to come to solve his problems. That's not the attitude that Daniel takes. We see here that Daniel prays, goes to his house, calls his friend, and they start to pray together. And God answers their prayers. God reveals the secrets and, the, the, and, and all the, the secrets and the dream and the interpretation of it, and they give thanks to God. Daniel does not go to try to confirm the dream. God, he knows that it is true. It is so. It is sure. His word is sure as he has said it. We need not to doubt at God's word. We need not to doubt as his revelation says. You know, we need to trust God's word. We need to take it as it is. Those are the lessons that we are getting from um uh, from the book of Daniel. Now let's let's go let's go back to Daniel. Now the first thing that we saw to just recap, the first thing that we saw about God is that God reads our thoughts, our minds, and intentions. And Satan is not able to do that. We see that to the wise men. The dream is not there, the interpretation is there, but they cannot tell what it is. So they cannot read the intentions and the thoughts of one's mind. Satan is not able to penetrate into our thoughts, but God is able to do so. We see that also when you read um, in Isaiah chapter 40, the fall of Satan, starting from verse 12. You know, Isaiah is asking a question, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? How art thou cut from the ground which did weaken the nation? And the Bible says, thou hast said where? In thy heart, 
I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my, my, my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also among, um, upon the mount of the congregation in the side of the north. I will, I will exalt my throne above the, the, the clouds of heaven and I will be like the most high. These are the things that the angels were not seeing. These are the angels that these are the things that the angels were not seeing, but God was able to see and penetrate to the heart of Satan and see exactly his thoughts and his motives and his intentions. So that's the first thing that we saw. That when the king was sitting in his bird, God saw his thoughts, God saw his heart, God saw his very, you know, the thoughts that were troubling him, his, his anxiety. And, you know, his, his trouble about what is going to happen in the future. And God revealed to him through a dream what exactly is going to happen to his kingdom. God takes away the dream and the interpretation exposes the wise men of Babylon. Secondly, we have learned that we are not to trust the wise men of this world. God has exposed them. God is not working through them. We are not to trust them. We are to trust the word of God. We are to trust the word of God. We have seen how God works from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 to 20, 20, 29, that God works through the foolish things of the world, weak things of the world, base things, things that are not to bring to naught things that are. We, 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 we remember the reason that that no flesh may glory in his presence so that no one can be able to take the glory to himself, but he may be able to bring the glory to God, direct all the glory to God. The forerunner, John the Baptist, that's what he would do. He says, I will decrease so that he may increase. That's the kind of attitude that we should have, servants of God. We are not to trust the wise men. We are not to trust the knowledge of this world, the wisdom of this world. Many are men in our ranks who are coming with the wisdom of the world, who are coming with the, with the, with the knowledge of the world, and they are trying to use that knowledge and wisdom of the world to try to twist the scriptures and to try to place doubt on the very divine revelation of God and God's people are to see. While God has warned us against these people, since we need to understand how God works. We need to understand how God works. God does not work through these people. God through works through his servants who are humble, who allow themselves to be stripped of their own glory, of their honor. God lays it to dust. And God, you know, it comes in and he's elevated in that way. So we see that God does not work through them. They have failed. God exposes their schemes. And we saw the device of Satan. Satan wants to kill God's people. He wants to destroy them because he sees how God is going to work to bring the truth to the hidden nation, to bring the truth and light to the hidden king. And he sees that there's a potential that the king may be converted. And Satan is working with all his power, his mind, all his devices to stop that from working. But we see that God is also counterreacting his actions and his plans. God does not allow his people to be killed. Daniel, and he does not allow them to be killed. In fact, God exalts them instead. God exalts them because they are exalted in, in, in the kingdom of Babylon. They are given positions and they serve in the courts in that way. And God is glorified. God is exalted in that way. In the book of Matthew, we are told, chapter five, Jesus says, you are the lights of the world. 
a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. So we are the light of the world. To, to bring light into this dark world, the light of truth, not only with our words, but with our lives, we are to leave the truth and shine that light to those that are in darkness. Since we see that uh, the book of Daniel is, is a very interesting one because God here reveals to us the forces that are in play in the last days. We see that the kingdom of Satan is working with all his power to try to stop God's plans, to try to destroy his work, to try to destroy his people, to discourage his servants. But we see that God is working with all his power to counteract the plans of Satan. And God is successful. It seems he is not working. It seems Satan is, is winning altogether. But that's not how it is, Saint. That's not how it is. We are going to see that, you know, this message is going to become more glorious. It is going to become more beautiful. It's going to shine so bright to the whole world as we near the end of time. When we are faithful to God, God will use us in that way. God will use us. And those are the lessons that I really want us, I, I wanted us to gather. We saw that God's method is that when we are met with a crisis, when I'm met with challenges, we, we resort to prayer. We pray to God. We, we, we bow to him. We call our fellow uh, like-minded, um, God's loving people, and we pray together with them. And God reveals to us that he answers prayers. He's the one who's very close to us. He is so close. He is so close that he answers our prayers. We have seen that, saints. Those are the lessons that I want us to pick up and to just take from this. Uh, we are going to continue with our study uh, next week. I pray that God may really help us. God may bless us. God may give us a hunger for the truth and to be clothed with his righteousness. And um, we are going to pray uh, for the points that we have covered. And we pray that God may, may seal these truths in our minds and may establish us in the truth, both intellectually and spiritually. Um, let us pray, saints. Our loving Father, we want to come before you, Lord, once again. We want to thank you so much. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us this opportunity to come and bow before you. The lessons we have learned, they are so precious. They are so important for us, Lord Father, as we prepare for the last crisis. We pray that you may develop our character. Help us, Lord Father, to, to be like Daniel. To be wise like Daniel. To ask for wisdom. Help us, Lord Father, to move as Daniel moved. To be allowed to allow you, Lord Father, to work in us, to do, to work, and to do according to your own pleasure. Pray that you may bless each and every one of us and help your church. And help us, Lord, open our minds as we are going to study these prophecies, that we may understand what has been revealed and what is coming. Please bless us. It is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be saved.